Hello, this is Professor Milsom. Uh, this will be our final lecture on Toni Morrison's Beloved. In this lecture, I'm going to give you a sort of historical overview so that the context of this book makes some sense. And this is always a f sort of uh, exciting moment for me in, in a course because it's a challenge to give all of United States history um, in one lecture, but uh, it's a challenge I like to face. And given how many backgrounds we come from at our school, you know, you can never sort of make any assumptions about what people know. I, I, I always remember one time teaching this, I, I said to the class, um, all right, so when was the Civil War? And then a student in the back raised her hand and she says, well, which Civil War? Uh, you know, she said, in my country, there was a Civil War recently. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, there's this sort of arrogance involved in assuming everyone has the same historical background. For me, um, it's arrogant on my part to assume that. So, you know, I, and, and then I remember my own history from high school uh, very vaguely, so it's good to always get reminded. And, and a lot of this you can find on Wikipedia and so forth, but when it comes to learning history, and particularly history that isn't pretty or fun, you can be sure that people over time start to erase the parts that don't make you look good. And um, there's a lot at stake in trying to think of our history as something noble and worth, you know, fighting for because we, we make people die for the idea of the United States all the time. And um, without actually knowing what, what happened, you can't really know what you're, you're fighting for or what you're representing. So just looking at the Wikipedia entries on things or even looking at your high school textbook, you can't really be sure of what you're learning, and I've found over the past 10 years even, there are a lot more resources that are based on primary documents that help us hear the voices that got silenced. And as Toni Morrison says in the foreword, you know, we're being invited into a graveyard, to camp out in a graveyard and hear the voices that don't necessarily get listened to in our past, and it's not a pleasant experience. So. Anyway, this is all to say I'm going to give you an overview of the um, United States history that led to the 19th century um, economic reliance on human enslavement. Remember, it's a self-reproducing workforce, so it's like a workforce that reproduces itself at free of charge and doesn't require health insurance or salaries or minimum wage. So. It was very, very lucrative, um, and this is the foundation for our economy today. I mean, the United States would not be the world power it is today without the labor of enslaved former Africans um, that never got paid and that were trafficked across international lines for hundreds of years. So this is this is how we can come to understand what Toni Morrison is teaching us in this novel. So let's look, this is just a review, Beloved, the novel. I drew this on the board as an extra credit assignment. You're welcome to depict this in a much better way. Um, there are three settings, three main settings in this novel. There are a lot of other ones as well. Um, and these are also different, they, they are different periods of time. So we have slavery, and, and the main site of slavery in this novel is the Sweet Home Plantation, which is in Kentucky, which is south of Ohio. Ohio's the north, Kentucky's the south. Ohio had no slavery at this point in the 1850s and 60s. Kentucky did, just across the Ohio River. And Sweet Home Plantation, we have Mr. and Mrs. Garner, who are the quote-unquote good slave owners, which, as we know, is very problematic. And the book talks about that a lot. Then Mr. Garner dies, um, suggested he's shot. We don't really know. Mrs. Garner brings this guy's school teacher and his two sons, maybe their ne nephews, we don't really know. 
Um, but Mr. Garner has raised his, it's a small plantation, small farm. You only have um, six people living on it, usually. There's Seth, who is brought on to replace um, Hallie's mother, Baby Shug. Hallie is her son, and then there's 6O, Paul A, Paul F, and Paul D. These are the sweet home men. Um, then we have the setting is sort of a journey. There's always a journey between enslavement and freedom. And the journey, we've got De uh, Seth going across the Ohio. She runs into white girl Amy. Denver is born on this journey. Um, there's the three kids sent ahead, Howard Bugler, the baby, a.k.a. Beloved. Um, we learn about that and why this whole group got separated in their escape. Then we have this setting, Freedom, which is Ohio, 124 Bluestone. We've got Baby Suggs, who dies, who lives there. And this is, then there's Seth, Denver, Howard, and Bugler. They both leave. They run away because the place is haunted. We've got Paul D. who shows up. And we've got this ghost haunts it, and then it, it turns into Beloved. Beloved, the perhaps the 18-year-old um, ghost of the baby that Seth had killed when she... Um, had escaped and then got caught by school teacher and the slave catchers. Okay, so we've got three settings. Um, we also have we could also do a whole different chart for Paul D. You know he goes all sorts of places. He ends up in Georgia for a while, living in a box in a hole, working on a chain gang. Um, we got Baby Suggs's journey. Um, it's a lot of different journeys. All right, and these are journeys over time. So so this is what I want to clarify today, which is that like. When did slavery begin? When did it become illegal? What happened afterwards? This book also is not just about slavery, but it's about its aftermath. Psychological aftermath, physical aftermath. What happened to all those thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people who were enslaved? Did they suddenly get free and have a good life? No. Um, and so, this, this book spans time periods, and it spans geography. Okay, so, like I said, when I talk about U.S. history, I like to go all the way back. So, here's the planet. Um, and I also want to make a point here and say, I say U.S. history as opposed to American history. This is something I'm trying to change. I'm try I used to say American history. Now, I, I try to say U.S. history. It's because was a student, one of my students, Sedostos, pointed out one time, you know, she's from um, South America, and I kept saying American history, and she's like, you know, when you talk about American history, you're not talking about my history. You're talking about the United States. And, and again, it's this sort of arrogance about, about calling all of the, you know, land, all the continents here America when I just am talking about the United States. And a lot of people in our country here do that. You know, Canada is America. Mexico is America. Ecuador, El Salvador, this is all America. And um, when, when someone says America and they just mean the United States, they're sort of, they're sort of erasing, you know, dozens of other countries. And it's, it's this sort of arrogance that I'm trying to get away from. But it's ingrained from like years and years being taught that way. And if you listen to the news and you listen to politicians, they do this all the time. It's interesting to pay attention to. All right, so, like I said, I like to go all the way back. And that's four million years. So, on this earth, there have been humanoids hunting and gathering on earth for four million years. A million is like one zero 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 okay and that's four times that all right for two hundred thousand of those years so two hundred thousand years ago societies originating here sub-saharan africa began to migrate so this is africa a continent not a country fyi um here's this the sahara desert here is not there aren't a lot of people who live in the Sahara Desert. Deserts aren't good places to live. There's no water. Um, so beneath the Sahara, 
sub-Saharan Africa, and there are tons and tons of communities. This is, you know, the origins of human life. And people started to migrate. All right. So 12,000 years ago, so this is the year we're in 2019. 20, so we're, that means we're 2019 years after year zero. Um, year zero, just for historical purposes, is the year Jesus Christ was born. It's like how we created this calendar that we use here. So 12,000, so you go back 2,000 and then another 10,000. So 10,000 BC, before Christ, or BCE, before Common Era. That's how timelines work. Some people stopped migrating. So people were here, Africa, hunting and gathering. Then 12,000, they started migrating, going all over the earth. Then people, some people stopped and they figured out how to plant things and grow them and they no longer had to walk around finding food, right? This is how we got agriculture, farming. All right, so by 8,500 BCE, so that's like 2,000 years ago plus 8,500 years ago, so, 10, so about 10,500 years ago, there were seven major agricultural communities in the world. So all over the world, there were like seven major communities. Three of these communities were in the Americas. So we've got Canada, this is, this is North America up here, South America down here, Central America here. And so three of the major civilizations on Earth were here. And was this is like 10,000 years ago, folks. You know, life didn't begin in America in 1492 when Columbus quote unquote discovered it. It was here. Civilization had arrived. So this is where these big civilizations were. They were based on corn. That's why I had that picture. Corn was the main crop. People figured out how to, to grow corn over here. We had the Valley of Mexico, very fertile. We had South Central Andes in South America down here, the Andes Mountains. And then we had the East Coast where we live right here, East Coast, very fertile, good for farming. Civilizations began flourishing. So by the end of the 15th century, that means 1400s, yes, that's when Columbus came over here and so-called discovered it. No. By the end of the 15th century, the population of this hemisphere, the Americas, before Columbus, was 100 million people. That's a lot of people. So, you know, this idea that this was empty space with no one on it, just a few... Native Americans uh, is just wrong. It's not historical fact, but it's an image we've sort of cultivated. You can ask yourself why that myth has persisted. We can talk about that, but this is really important to understand. Before Columbus arrived, yeah, the population of this hemisphere was 100 million people. Okay. Meanwhile, back in Europe, this is also very important to understand. 1444, so that's, you know, like a generation before Columbus arrived. In 1444, here is Portugal. This was where the first major European auction of black and white slaves happened, right here in Portugal. And it was black, it was white. Remember, one of the most important things about American slavery, U.S. Slave, slavery, is that it was the first race-based enslavement on a major scale. Okay, so there was, I mean, there's always been slavery. You can read about it in the Bible, Old Testament, but it wasn't commodified on a large scale until the 15th century. And it wasn't based on race until it became economically very useful in the colonies. So just keep that in mind. So 1444, the first major European auction of black and white slaves happened in Portugal. Oh, and another thing to say, the word slave comes from Slav, which was what they called people from Eastern Europe. And so the, and, and, and people from this area were white. So, you know, it's important to recognize that there were white and black slaves and they were being auctioned in Portugal. But this is a generation before Columbus. Now, by 1481, this had become very profitable. The Portuguese built a fort in Ghana, which is in West Africa, to mine for gold 
and to hold slaves. And guess who was there watching this extravaganza? That's right, Christopher Columbus. He was in Africa. He went to Ghana. He saw the big fort, which is still there, by the way. And he was like, wow, this looks like a way to get rich. Okay, so here we are down here in Africa. This is where Ghana is. He's like, I see how to get rich. So he goes to Portugal. He couldn't get them to fund his trip to India for golden spices. So he convinced the Queen of Spain to send him. So he, you know, they didn't know that there was a whole continent over here. So he thought he would make a quick trip over to India just by sailing this way, sailing west. He would hit India because he didn't know. And he was like, he was a great sailor, so he convinced the Queen of Spain to send him. Okay. Well, whoops. What do you know? 60 days later, this is not India. Many of you recognize that land in red. It's what we call Hispaniola, aka Dominican Republic, and Haiti. We have Cuba as well. We've got, you know, Florida here. Gulf of Mexico. He ended up in Hispaniola instead of India. He immediately, remember, this guy had seen how to make money. He's looking for gold like they had in Ghana. He started killing and enslaving indigenous people immediately in the name of God. And there's journals, there's records of this. I mean, they would cut off hands, they'd rape and enslave people. People started killing their children to avoid being put into the hands of the um, invaders. It was grisly. It was grim. It was the worst thing. One of the worst things that's ever happened. Um, and then in uh, 1510, they had killed so many of the natives, the Tainos, the Taino people. Um, and they had made them sick with all their European diseases that... They were too weak to work in the sugarcane fields. This, this was a lucrative, very profitable industry. Um, so they decided, I know, Columbus is like, I know where we can find strong individuals. We can get them from Africa. And they brought them from Africa to do the labor of the sugarcane plantations in the islands. And um, this is how the transatlantic slave trade began. What's really important to understand here is that in this time, in 1510, thanks to the fact that they had killed off all of the natives of the islands, the Tainos, people were, were killing themselves to avoid being put to work for these, for these invaders, the colonial invaders. This is the time when this idea, this racist idea, this racist belief that persists with us to this day, that there's the physically strong, beastly African slave and the physically weak Native American who does not like hard work. These are racist ideas that were born in this moment. And you can trace this in the writings from the period, the way that the colonists, the colonizers talked about the people they had killed and were importing. And, you know, it was so profitable and lucrative to bring people over from Africa in these slave ships that even if half, half the people died on the ship, it would still be profitable. So they didn't really care how they were treated. Um, and so that's how we got the transatlantic slave trade. Now, I'm going to fast forward through history a little bit here, just to be reasonable. Between 1525 and 1866. So 1866, that's the end period of the Civil War. Um, and that brings us to when Beloved's taking place. In this period of time, over 300 years, 12.5 million Africans were shipped to the colonies. And if you click, you check out this link from the PowerPoint, it brings you to this amazing, devastating video um, where a bunch of historians, they took records of all the um, ships that came across um, based on logs. And you can see there aren't that many in 1575. Um, I don't have data on everything. Okay, so like the NS de la Concepcion, 16 journeys transported. So it tells you everything about all these ships, how many Africans. Um, gives you a little account of the journey. 
I mean, this is really shocking stuff, but you can watch this and you can see down here there's a chart of how many, and like you can also see a lot of ships were going down to South America. Ton Brazil took in more enslaved Africans than any other place, what we now call Brazil. So you can see as time goes on, let's skip ahead. Here we are, 1680. You can start seeing there's an increase going to the Caribbean. This is called the transatlantic slave trade, AKA the middle passage. Middle because it's happening in the middle here. This is the Atlantic Ocean. Every one of these dots is a ship, right? So again, Fort Amsterdam. So the, the Dutch were trading a lot. Um, let's fast forward. Here we are. 1774. This is right around the time of the American Revolution, 1776. So this is like our founding fathers were writing their constitution. The true blue. So Ghana going to the United States. So the United States hasn't been formed, of course, but this is going to Georgia. Um, and you, know, you can see who is the captain. They um, total slaves embarked. Uh, total slaves embarked, that means 352 got on, 287 got off, so you can imagine that's how many died along the way. They don't have names necessarily. Um, so this is a really important resource. It's also shocking to watch, you know, millions of people, 12.5 million people crossing this way. Okay. Um, so I'll close that, get back to the slides here. So, uh, these are, um, let's try to, yeah, full screen. Oops, go back. Um, in the midst of all this, the United States, well, the American colonies, the colony, they're British colonies, Brit colonies of Britain, Great Britain. Um, there's a war, the colonists no longer wanted to be British. They wanted to be independent. If you watch the musical Hamilton, that's what's going on. Although I have some thoughts about that. But anyway, just ask me another time. 1776, all men are created equal. That's the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson, a slave rapist with 200 slaves. Okay, so what does it really mean when a slave rapist who owns who's a sex trafficker basically writes that all men are created equal? Well, we meet, we know from you know, you can see this in Beloved, enslaved people don't count as men. They're not people. And certainly women aren't men. So um, this is the context, right? So, okay, here's more information than you probably need for our purposes here about, like, the religious reasons for which people colonize the United, what we call the United States now, and the first Thanksgiving, the Mayflower, City on a Hill, all the religious things. Um, you can look at this in your own detail, in your own time. Um, here we are, 19th century. Remember, 19th century means 1800s. So here we are. This is this is when Beloved's taking place. This is when Margaret Garner, um, enslaved, kills her child. Okay, so 1861 to 65. That's the time of the American or the U.S. Civil War. That's what the war that gets referred to in the book is. Um, 1863, Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. That's when it was legally made, it was made illegal to own slaves in the United States. But, um, you know, since the war was going on, uh, not everyone was, in, was freed. And then slavery was abolished in 1865, the end of the war. Then we have this period, and this is when a lot of the book takes place, 1865 to 77. This is a period known as Reconstruction. It is um, shockingly under taught in schools. It's a very important period of time. There were more black people in power during this time than ever have been before because they were granted legal rights. But along with that rise in power came backlash and that's when the Ku Klux Klan rose. So in this period of reconstruction, there were 400 lynchings. That's, you know, targeted killings of black people. There was a Civil Rights Act in 1875, which the Supreme Court rejected in 1883. 
And there became a lot of voter fraud to prevent black people from voting. Now you have an entire population of people, many of whom were like the majority in their, in their, in their counties. Um, slaves often outnumbered the non-slaves. Um, and, but as, as you know, for generations, they weren't allowed to write or read. So then they would make like reading tests on, this, on the polls. And so black people couldn't vote. So once black people couldn't vote, black people stopped getting elected. And, and then in the late 1800s, 80s and 90s, Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws were um, established to legalize segregation. So yes, there was this great moment of freedom after the war when in theory, black people had more liberty, but then there was a backlash, very racist backlash Jim Crow, legalized segregation, and then in 1896, this Supreme Court case, Plessy versus Ferguson, which made um, segregation legal. All right, so between 1882, the end of Reconstruction, and 1968, so this is like in my mother's lifetime, there were over 3,000 lynchings of black Americans. Woodrow Wilson, the president in 1915, screened this mil film, um, Birth of a Nation, in the White House. And this, he thought it was the most important movie ever made, um, early film, it inspired the KKK because it depicts the KKK as these like white noble warriors. The KKK established itself, reestablished itself because people were inspired by the depiction of the KKK in this movie. Generation later during World War II, you know, um, Japanese Americans were being put into concentration camps in the United States um, because there was a war being fought abroad against Japan. So they decided that Japanese Americans need to be incarcerated. And then this was found unconstitutional, Korematsu versus the United States. Um, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Legally, it, it, it was a legal finding that separate is not in fact equal. Again, this some of our parents were alive when this happened. Rosa Parks wouldn't give up her seat in 1955. Emmett Till, the 15 year old boy was murdered. Uh, and this white woman claimed he had whistled at her. Later, she admitted he hadn't. He was 15. He was brutally murdered by some white guys that night. And his mother displayed him in a casket, open casket. So his photograph was in the news. And it, it launched, it's one of the things that launched the civil rights movement. Um, I'm just giving you these like more modern dates, just to put it in context, we had the Civil Rights Act finally in 1964, 65 Malcolm X was assassinated, 66 was when the Black Par Panther Party was formed, and 68 was when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. If you're hearing in this echoes of things going on today, what with the border detentions and separating families, you're not wrong, that's something that's still with us. So this is history that really reflects the present. and. In this context, um, we can start make, to make sense of it. It doesn't seem so out of line with our history when you know your history, okay? All right, so just, mm, I, I'm, these are a couple, a few books and resources I've used um, to make these slides, so you can take a look at this. Um, there's this great History of American Slavery project on Slate.com. That's where that uh, slave ship middle passage um, depiction comes from, that, that site. And then there's Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's Indigenous People's History of the United States, which gives a really good account of the myth mythology surrounding what we talk about when we talk about United States history. And then we have Ibram X. Kendi's Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. That's a really helpful book. Um, and it talks about the, the birth of racist ideology, um, why it happened, who it benefited. It's, it's a very easy to read sort of history book. He's a professor at American University. All right, so in our novel, Beloved, there's actually a few bits where she references historical um, terminology that I direct you in the plot questions to take a look at. 
And so if you look on page 204, for instance, there's this list, the fugitive bill, the settlement fee, God's ways and Negro pews, anti-slavery, manumission, skin voting, Republicans, Dred Scott, book learning, sojourners, high wheeled buggy, the colored ladies of Delaware, Ohio, and the North Star. And I encourage you to take one of these and look it up, maybe share it on the discussion board. Um, there's a lot of pockets of information like this that these are all terms that you need to know. Um, and another thing um, to talk about is during the period of slavery, before the Civil War, there was a big abolitionist movement. Aboli abolition comes from the word abolish, you need to get rid of. There were a lot of people who wanted to get rid of slavery, including white people. And the Botkins are characters, Bodwins are the characters who represent these abolitionists. And while it's good that they weren't, you know, trafficking slaves, um, there is some criticism launched at people like this who who use the suffering of, of the enslaved to sort of make themselves into heroes. It, it, it be becomes sort of more about becoming a hero rather than helping people, and Morrison's very critical of this. Um, and just a little bit here, I will have you writing about this very issue in your third essay. Just a little Easter egg there for you. So here we are, in, late in the novel, page 212. Um, Stamp paid. You know, he's the one who had carried uh, people across the Ohio River during slavery before the Civil War. He was part of the Underground Railroad, former slave himself. In this scene, again, it's sort of a it's a flashback. We've got a lot of flashbacks to disorient you with. Um, He's walking to 124 Bluestone, and this is after Paul D has left, and it seems like Seth is, like, gone crazy. This is the way it's being depicted. Um, they he, There's a rumor that there's some strange woman there. This is Beloved, the ghost, and Denver, who, by the way, it, like has left home one time in, like, the past decade. Um, Denver is is there. Seth has quit her job. They're all sort of starving, possibly dying, and Stampede decides he's going to go find out. You know, and as he's walking back, he's thinking about how he regrets he treated how he treated Baby Suggs after the death of Beloved. Um, he's filled with regret, and he and this is the narration. He's thinking about Baby Suggs here. The white folks quote. The white folks had tired her out at last, and him. This means, like, you know, after the big incident where Seth has killed her child and gone to prison and so forth, and Baby Suggs has stopped having um, gatherings in the clearing. He, he says, the white folks had tired her out at last, and him. 1874, and white folks were still on the loose. Whole towns wiped clean of Negroes. 1887 lynchings in one year alone in Kentucky. Four colored schools burned to the ground. Grown men whipped like children. Children whipped like adults. Black women raped by the crew. Property taken, necks broken. He smelled skin, skin and hot blood. The skin was one thing, but human blood cooked in a lynch fire was a whole other thing. The stench stank, stank up off the pages of the North Star. That's this anti-slavery um, newspaper. Out of the mouths of witnesses, etched in crooked handwriting and letters delivered by hand. And this is, he's thinking back on how, you know, the war had ended, but things hadn't really gotten good. And um, this is, and then he's going to talk about how he found that red ribbon. He thought it was a cardinal feather, but a red bird's feather, but it turned out it was a ribbon and, and he found it in the water attached to a little girl's hair. Is still attached to the scalp, and this is a, he keeps that ribbon with him all, all the time as a reminder. So, again, this is like after slavery has ended, and this is the aftermath. And so, he's you know, he's checking in on 124, and it's feeling haunted again. And he it says, The day stamp paid saw this is page 234, the day stamp paid saw the two backs through the window and then hurried down the steps. 
He believed the undecipherable language clamoring around the house was the mumbling of the bat black and angry dead. Very few had died in bed, like baby Suggs, and none that he knew of, including baby, had lived a livable life. So this is when he's seeing Beloved for the first time. Um, he looks in the window. And when he's walking around that house, you know, he's hearing voices. He's hearing... the. It's haunted. Um, he's hearing ghosts and... Is, the book is implying that this is sort of the the dead who have not had good deaths. They they linger around. And he, he says, he's thinking here, we're, we're sort of getting his thoughts. Very few people had died like baby Suggs in bed, which is like nice, but he know, there's none. He knows no one that had lived a livable life. You get that live, livable life, life three times in that sentence. Um... He doesn't know anyone whose life was, like, livable. That's how bad life was. And, um, you know, sentences like that really cut through. There's nothing positive in that. Uh, this is a longer passage um, from that page, 234. White people, and you notice white people is one word. Um, I think that kind of evokes how it's like a monolith or how it's said like white people it's like a thing to contend with it's an other an unknowable other the white people who, and it's this group of people who do things that you can't understand white people believed that whatever the manners under every dark skin was a jungle um this is like stamp sort of thinking about uh you know how could things be this bad? Like, how could there be a whole group of people doing such bad things to um, millions of people? This is just when you contemplate the 19th century, 18th century, the hundreds of years of enslavement, the transatlantic slave trade, the Middle Passage. This is kind of what comes up. You're like, how can this happen? And this is an attempt through Stamp Page's perspective, to sort of reckon with that, to figure that out. Toni Morrison trying to figure it out. White people believed that whatever the manners under every dark skin was a jungle. Swift, unnavigable waters, swinging, screaming baboons, sleeping snakes, red gums, rem ready for the sweet white blood. Now you remember, think back to this, like the birth of racist ideas in 1510. Um, how Africa is this like, you know, sort of indecipherable jungle. This is this history of racist thought right here. Back to the quote. In a way, he thought they were right. The more colored people spent their strength trying to convince them how gentle they were, how clever and loving, how human, the more they used themselves up to persuade the whites of something Negroes could, believed could not be questioned. The deeper and more tangled the jungle grew inside. But it wasn't the jungle blacks brought with them to this place from the other livable place. So the livable place you can think of is like Africa. It was, and, he's, and he's saying it wasn't the jungle blacks brought with them to this place from the other place. They're not bringing a jungle, right? There's no jungle. It was the jungle white folks planted in them, and it grew. So it's this idea of the jungle, like there's some wild, savage place, and they plant it in these people, okay? And it grew. It spread in, through, and after life it spread until it invaded the whites who had made it, touched everyone changed and altered them made them bloody silly worse than even they wanted to be so scared were they of the jungle they had made the screaming babu lived under their own white skin the red gums were their own meantime the secret spread of this new kind of white folks jungle was hidden silent except once in a while you could hear its mumbling in places like 124 um okay this is like an extended metaphor about the jungle, and what it represents. It's this like savagery, but what the book is saying here, what Stamp Page is sort of thinking about, it was like, there's no like literal jungle that exists inside a black skin, but it's this racist idea that was imposed and then planted in them. Like the jungle is a seed and it so it's like a metaphor and it grew and it spread in and through after life. And, and really, What's happening is like it's, and you and there's this part here. The more they they tried to convince the whites how gentle they were, how clever and loving, how human. It's like this effort to try to appear human. 
um, the worse it gets. Like, you shouldn't have to convince anyone of your humanity to begin with, right? And in doing so, it just makes it worse. Because it's like the effort to convince makes it seem like there needs to be a convincing. Um, and it's really the pe it's the racism that makes the racist people the ones who are really infected. And this passage really makes me think about this um, letter, James Baldwin, another 20th century author, black author from Harlem. Um, he wrote this letter to his nephew in 1962, talking about racism in this country. I highly recommend you read it. I'm not going to go into depth here about it. Um, you can access it here, and you can look it up. It's pretty short. He published it, um, but he's talking to his his nephew, who's named after him, who's you know trying to understand and cope with the racism in the United States. And he's talking about white people. He says, now my dear namesake, you named after me, these innocent and well-meaning people, your countrymen, have caused you to be born under conditions not far removed from those described for us by Charles Dickens in the London of more than 100 years ago. I hear the chorus of innocent screaming, no, this is not true, how bitter you are. You know, it's like, I'm talking about racism, and then I'm getting accused of being bitter. But I am writing this letter to you to try to tell you something about how to handle them, for most of them do not yet really know that you exist. I know the conditions under which you were born, for I was there. Your countrymen were not there and haven't made it yet. Your grandmother was also there, and no one has accused her of being bitter. I suggest that the innocent check in with her. Check with her. Innocent, he's referring to people who, like, don't even know that they're racist. Um, he's using the word innocent um, somewhat ironically. She isn't that hard to find. Your countrymen don't know that she exists either, though she has been working for them all their lives. Please try to be clear, dear James, through the storm which rages about your youthful head today, about the, the reality that which lies behind the words acceptance and integration. There is no reason for you to try to become like white men, and there is no basis whatever for their impertinent assumption that they must accept you. The really terrible thing, old buddy, is that you must accept them, and I mean that very seriously. You must accept them and accept with love, for these innocent people have no other hope. They are, in effect, still trapped in a history which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. They've had to believe for many years and for innumerable reasons that black men are inferior to white men. So he's referring here to like the history in this country and the deep roots of racism. They continue, many of them indeed know better, but as you will soon discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds and hearts of most white Americans is the loss of their identity, unquote. So Baldwin's talking about here the fact that, you know, at the heart of white identity in the United States is white supremacy. And this is what we're getting at toward the end of Beloved, too, with Stamp Paid. And with these abolitionist white people, um, and... Even, in, even though enslavement is like legally ended, I'll go back to the book here, page 247, here's Denver describing Baby Sook's death, quote, that what she thought about what the heart and what the body could do was wrong. The white people came anyway in her yard. She had done everything right and they came in her yard anyway, meaning like school teacher and the slave catcher and the nephew, they came into the yard to take Seth. And she didn't know what to think, and all she all she had left was her heart, and they busted it, so even the war couldn't re, couldn't rouse her. So, like, here's Baby Suggs. She did everything right. She was free legally. Um, she was doing good for her people. It did not matter. There's this idea of good versus bad white people. You know, the Garners on Sweet Home were considered good slave owners, but... Um, this is always subject to criticism. So this is page 260. For years, Paul D. believed school teacher broke into children what Garner had raised into men. Remember, they called the sweet home men. And it was that that made them run off. Now, plagued by the contents of his tobacco tin, remember, tobacco tin is a metaphor for Paul D.'s heart. He wondered how much difference there really was between school teacher and after. Garner called and announced the men, but only on sweet home and by his leave. So, like, they were only men because Garner called them that, right? So, really, they weren't men. Um, 
Was he naming what he saw or creating what he did not? That was the wonder of Sixo and even Halley. It was always clear to Paul D. that those two men, those two were men, whether Garner said so or not. Okay, so there's this idea like, you know, saying that there are good white slave owners is like saying it's up to them to determine who gets to be a human. And the fact is that people are human regardless. Um, and like they, they all got kind of fooled by the Garners. Um, so think about that when you think about the abolitionist people in this text. And um, we're going to just end here. You know, this book doesn't give us a very... Uh, it doesn't give us a, a lot to go on and feel good about, but like I said at the beginning of this, we're getting a sort of emotional and um, psychological access. We're getting psychological access to things that have been unrecorded because these people's voices were silenced. And that's why I think it's very important to actually learn this history so that you can better hear these voices um, because we lose a lot and when we lose these voices we sort of can we can fool ourselves into thinking these things aren't happening now which we all know is not true um, but it also makes the present more comprehensible like we can understand what's happening better now because it's not all that removed from what was happening 100 200 years ago okay so good luck with everything and this is the end i know this was a long lecture it's hard to pack all of beloved into a few lectures but i hope it's been helpful and if you want to talk more please let me know again uh, it takes a lot of courage to get deep into this book and um, it's hard to do it justice but i hope uh, you've developed an appreciation at least for why uh, Toni Morrison is considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, author of um, the past century. And losing her a few months ago was truly a loss, especially at this time. Okay, and I'll sign.